So again, I'll indicate Matt's voice and my voice. Matt, where do you want to go now? Sean, I feel like I want to study. I feel like in many incarnations, mind and scholarship have been very interesting to me. I've uh, had to kind of play the role of teacher many times, even in formal kinds of settings. So I'm always trying to create models and cosmologies to try to get a bigger and bigger picture. So I would like to get time and access to resources to try to broaden my model. My model. Matt, so where do you go? Sean, I go over to our library. Matt, what does it look like? Sean, once again, I know that the energy of information and insight can be metaphorically represented by any kind of architectural or physical constructs, and that that is just an aid. But I know that all knowing and all insight is communicated differently. It just helps to have metaphors and constructs. So I'm going to see an extraordinarily elegantly designed building with tomes and scrolls and chambers where there is immediate transfer of information and data and insight without the medium of any written or spoken word. And so, just for old time's sake, I'm going to play around with scrolls and books for a bit. But then I want to go where the learning is much faster. So it's almost just a, a sense of nostalgia that takes me into the stacks. I hang out there for a while, recognizing some of the volumes and smiling, and some old scrolls and parchments, some that need to be unrolled, some in very different orthographies and scripts. Matt, is there something you're drawn to? Sean, I'm really drawn to a different part of this building, a place where information and insight is more immediately acquired. And so after doing a nostalgic tour of the stacks, I want to go to this other place. Matt, so now you're going to that place. Sean, right, right. It's a, a circular room, and in the middle of the room is this interesting device, like a bed, except it's a very interesting shape. It's like, I don't know the term that Leonardo da Vinci gave it, this figure spread eagle on a wheel. There are five kinds of extremities on this bed. One for the head, one for each of the two hands, one each for the two legs, and then one for the torso. So it's like a five-pronged crucifix, but it's really soft material, and you lie on it quite comfortably. And since I have just come from Earth time and Earth life, I give myself a body to lie on this. I close my eyes and become aware of the most exotic of sounds emanating from I know not where. It's like an acoustical chamber with music of the spheres. There aren't any words and there is no discernible structure to the sounds and the flows, but I feel like my entire body is being bathed and energized and educated. And for want of a better word, as if data and information are being taken in almost as if by osmosis from the sound waves. It's not just as if my head is getting it. It's like every part of me is acting like a conduit for the acquisition of this insightful information. Matt, is there something important you're learning from your Russian life 
that is helpful for your life as Sean and the work you're doing here? Sean, yeah. It's having the courage to not define myself in opposition to the structures or institutions or events, but to define myself by my beginningless origins and my endless destination. And to be able to walk excitedly and purposefully into the mystery with a sense of awe and humor, no matter where it takes me. And I'm getting it that at each stage of this journey, it may be necessary temporarily to create models and cosmologies, to try to make experiences meaningful and to try to make sense of what I am encountering, but that I should never get so attached to a model that I cannot let go of it when it proves inadequate. So it's like I need to create the, uh, the image that's coming to me is like climbing a very high mountain that I can establish a base camp and then I have to move away from it and establish a camp much higher up and then move from that and keep moving from camp to camp. Each one of them serves its purpose, but none of them is the destination. Matt, the model is not the journey. Sean, right, yeah. But it's an important phase of finding moorings that make sense of experience. And particularly when I accept the role of being a teacher to anybody or any group, that part of my contribution is to, is to propose models that extend their thinking and widen their horizons and invite them deeper into the mystery rather than cling tenaciously to the security of previous models. And there are some basic tenets to this. And the first of them is that I am an, I am an eternal being that all beings are eternal beings. And any model that doesn't take cognizance of that is going to prove very inadequate very quickly. And I hear that every one of us is a teacher to the other. Even when there is a designated division of relationship between pupil and instructor, that they're both teaching each other. and that there is never a wasted experience. Not even the most mundane of sensations or encounters is happenstance or coincidence or accident. It's all purposeful and meaningful and instructive and growth promoting. And that there is a, there is not a single leaf on a single tree in a single forest that doesn't contain everything. And that I will know this when I know how to look. Matt, how does this feel? Sean, really, really freeing. I've just had this visual image of a photograph taken from the Hubble telescope of a star cluster in which scientists have discovered a new planet, which is about 5.5 times the size of Earth, but Earth-like in its qualities. And I see this image of red, orange, greeny, blue, millions of light years across. And I think, how could anybody who witnesses something like that ever be afraid again of any encounter on a tiny planet in a remote galaxy. And I think of an experience with my grandfather this lifetime as Sean. When we were living in a little house in the countryside in a very remote area with no indoor plumbing. 
And we had an outside shed, maybe 50 meters from the house, on a little hillock. Just a corrugated iron building with a bucket as a toilet. And I remember him coming home one night from the pub, and he was very happy, and he was singing. And he went to go to the outhouse, and it was a beautiful starry night. And he went in, and suddenly the wind came and whipped the whole building from around him and dumped it about 20 yards away. And he's sitting on the can, and I can hear him distinctly saying, He's smiling and laughing and looking up at the sky and he's musing and he's saying aloud to himself, <laughs> and they say there's no God. <laughs> and he was incredulous at the stupidity of anyone who could look at the night sky and claim there was no God. That's kind of the same experience when I look at the photo from the Hubble telescope. Or sometimes in the forest, I just look at a spider making a web. Extraordinary, intricate. And I can't imagine how anybody cannot be in awe. And how we can be so preoccupied with dumb things. And I got it that any cosmology has to make room for spiders and leaves. Matt, are you ready to move from here? Sean, let me stay just one moment. I have two kind of complimentary things now coming through. One of them says to me, be prepared to renounce everything you've just said when the time is right. And in the meantime, Teach whatever expands the minds of those who look to you in any way for guidance. Offer them a better model, but don't ever think it's the ultimate model. And I'm remembering something that I thought about some months back. The saddest people in the world are people who have no story. And then the next level are people who have stories that crucify them. And the happy people, they have stories that liberate them. And then the truly enlightened people are again people who have no stories. Matt, what do you mean by that? Sean, it feels like all of us who volunteer for Earth Mission are somewhere on the scale between fear and liberation. And stories are part of the liberating process. And then we have to let go of them. Matt, are stories the same thing as cosmologies? Sean, yeah, they're just more fun. Matt, say more. Sean, and I hear that when I eventually get to the place where I don't need stories anymore, as a teacher, I still have to have stories in my repertoire for people who do need stories. Matt, are you complete here? Sean, I think that's pretty much it. Matt, what is your soul name? Sean, I don't want to say so Dave has a very interesting uh, comment in st about stories. When I talk about you know, going from no story to no story, the, and he's talking about the importance of story, that identity is connected up with story. So why would you abandon that? So um, I started off this idea years and years ago when I counted my first case as a psychologist of somebody who was catatonic. And if you've ever visited a ward where somebody is catatonic, and literally, they're frozen into immobility, into physical immobility. They adopt a physical posture, you know, and you can't distract them. They're kind of just totally, you know, it's like they're dead inside. And their physical body is like, as has been sculpted into a particular position and is incapable of moving. And when I look at such a person, it feels to me that um, this person has been so traumatized by life 
that they cannot engage with the storyline. They cannot tell you why they are the way they are because to revisit the story is to re-traumatize themselves. And so it's like an escape mechanism is to have no story, to be kind of um, both physically and emotionally and mentally just sculpted into a particular position. And that um, in order to kind of work with, a, with a, somebody who's catatonic, you have to invite them into storytelling time. You cannot, they cannot be liberated from a catatonia unless they re-engage again with a story. And if you can actually manage to kind of communicate with them, you know, and they get to articulate what the terrible story is that forced them into catatonia, that's the beginning of the liberating process, but it's a terrible story. And you run the risk of re-traumatizing the person by somehow facilitating their emergence from the catatonic state. And then what you need to do is see if you can get them to change the story. To say, okay, I totally understand the, the trauma you've experienced. Was there anybody in your life, you know, that was a refuge for you? Was there a grandmother figure in your life, you know, or a teacher in school that somehow saw you for who you really were, you know? And so you get them now into kind of um, rediscovering a buried story, a good story. And then you encourage them to string together a bunch of the good stories. And now they're in storytelling time again. And that storytelling, you know, initially is crucifying them because it's all bad stories and traumatic events that happened. But then slowly by slowly, you encourage them to engage with the happy encounters they had. So now you're getting to change the storyline. And now their sense of self is changed from this kind of crippled individual to somebody who's been in, in stages of liberation. And you encourage them again and again and develop that, develop that new story, that new theme you know, of liberation or joy or happiness or safety, whatever you encountered it. And we spend most of our lives and most of our incarnations in storytelling mode, you know, so we all need stories. And I, I believe that um, the stories are the archive wisdom of entire culture. If you go to any new group of people and you want to understand their innate wisdom, go to their stories and to their proverbs. So the stories are the archived wisdom and the proverbs are the one line or distillations of the stories. So in order to understand anybody, you need to listen to their story. In order to understand, you need to be able to articulate what your story is. In order to be to interface with other cultures, you need to learn what their mythology and their stories are. But inevitably, all of our stories are tied to a kind of a three-dimensional physical sense of self as individual people or as a, a, a tribe of people. And so that is really, really limiting. And no matter how good the story is, the story is limiting because it's it's built around it's built around the archetype of the ego to use Jungian kind of language. So um, the ego is kind of the constellation of experiences I've had that uh, that cluster around the kind of the, the the complex or the archetype of the ego. And uh, however liberating it may be as a part of the journey, ultimately it's confining that the any story which identifies me with my physical being or with my profession or with my ethnicity or with my relationships or with my gifts or with my problems yeah, as an individual person or as a tribe of people, that is inherently a limiting story. The only unlimited story is there is no need to make up any kind of a container to kind of a hold who I am. Because who I am is God experiencing herself in 3D uh, uh, dimension. And so ultimately, I have to forego all my stories as individuals and as cultures. And it's only when I have no story left that I am totally immersed in the divine. Uh, so at that stage for me, the ultimate, st the ultimate um, uh, point, destination point is to abandon all of my stories, all of my cos cosmologies, be prepared to kind of climb higher and higher up the mountain until finally, there is no need to camp out. I have, I have encountered the transcendent. I have been absorbed into the ocean of the infinite, the infinity of God's love. And I don't need any kind of a, a particular kind of a separation from that in order to discover who I am. I've been subsumed from being a quark to being an atom, to being a molecule, to being a cell, to being an organ, to being an organism, to being a family member, a member of a community, a tribe, a uh, um, sentient beings in the universe, I've been subsumed until finally there is only God experiencing herself again. So at that stage, stories get in the way. So Susan's question is, how do you exist without having a story? Just before we started this session, we had a kind of a sing-song 
where we're celebrating she and I or Irish heritage by singing a song together. So how do you kind of, uh, how do you get to the place where you don't need stories anymore? So there's a beautiful um, uh, Buddhist notion, a differentiation between what they call Turiya and Turiyatita. Turiya is the ability uh, to kind of identify with the witnessing consciousness. So it's like you totally stand outside of uh, incarnation and you witness what's happening at the 3D level. So you're a witness to it, but you're not a participant in it. But there's a place beyond that they call Turiyatita. And Turiyatita is the ability to both be in the witness modality and at the same time to be a participant. It's what social anthropology or cultural anthropology will call the, the participant observer. So the old idea was that, you know, a kind of um, a Westerner could go into an Aboriginal society as a, an observer and just stand back and watch what the natives were doing and study their language or whatever. As if, you know, the native population didn't know a year before the uh, scientists went down there that he was coming. They picked it up, you know, in, in the ether. They knew exactly there was going to be some kind of an intrusion into society. And to think that people were just then behaving naturally so that the observer could watch and take notes and write a thesis on it is ludicrous. You cannot not influence a culture. As soon as you move into it, your presence is influencing the behavior of everybody else. And so the trick then becomes to become a participant observer. So you're both experiencing incarnation with all of the cultural kind of stories that come along with it, which is really good, but you're not identified with it. There's the, there's the witnessing part of you that says, okay, that's what I volunteer to do in incarnation, and I'm going to do it the very best I can, but I'm not going to identify with that. I know that's a role I took on. You know, and I played it to the best of my ability, but it is not my core identity. And so it's the ability to walk with with, with the two legs, you know, to realize that uh, I volunteer to be here. I got to play my role to the best of my ability. And that role means I'm part of a family, I'm part of a culture, you know, and I'm going to use all of those things to kind of to try to love people and be compassionate and to kind of uh, do my best to be of service to them. But I'm not going to ever identify with that, make the mistake. But very, very few people get to that stage. We identify with so many things that create divisions within families and uh, between between cultures. And so this um, this identification with less than our source self is the origin of all human conflict. So it does not mean that we don't have to participate. We do have to participate, but we have to resist the temptation of getting identified with it. So the stories are important because they're part of our role that we agree to play but they do not define who we are. So Ingrid has made some fascinating comments, a few questions embedded it, and then some really great insights where she's talking about um, Atlantis, uh, this mythological place, and I'm not using mythological in any pejorative sense whatsoever. It's the place occupied uh, in our mythologies. Uh, and she went on to talk about even the possibility of modern uh, technologies that can regrow limbs or her, her encounter at, at John of God. Uh, so it embedded of crystals all around the bed to kind of int introduce uh, different kinds of energies. So I, I say a bunch of stuff about that. The first thing is that I personally have never had uh, a reincarnational experience of being in Atlantis um, at a personal level. I do believe that it existed very strongly. In fact, um, Irish mythology is based on, we have two terms for it in Gaelic. One of them is called Tionomog, which means the land of the ever young. And the other one is called Tir Fahaun, which means the land under the waves. And there's lots of our great Irish stories about characters, Irish characters, who went into this land under the waves, which is Atlantis. And so that um, it's a place where people never didn't grow old and where there's extraordinary technology. So deeply embedded in the Irish mythology is a belief system in Atlantis, except we, we call it two different names, Tir Nonog and Tir Fahaun. So that's very definitely part of Irish mythology. Now, I think that human history is is cyclical in this. I think actually it's more spiral than cyclical. I do not believe that history is um, circular, that we're just going around and around and around, revisiting the same issues and making the same mistakes again. I think it is spiral that we revisit the same issues, but that we deal with it more and more adroitly. So we're making progress if we're doing it properly. If we're not doing it properly, we're digging ourselves into a rut. Uh, but the, that evolution is a spiral rather than a circle, and it's certainly not linear, uh, and that therefore we're, uh, there have been different, there have been previous epochs in human history when we've developed uh, similar technologies to what we have now, and maybe much more advanced technologies. They talk about Lemuria, which was an earlier civilization even than Atlantis, and if you go back into 
Sanskrit mythology. There's a belief system that, you know, we've revisited these on, on, on a scale of millions and millions and millions of years time. That it's not just, you know, Atlantis allegedly was maybe 12,000 years ago mm -hmm. and Lemuria before that, but that there has been, uh, there, there was even ge geological and archaeological evidence, you know, that artifacts have been discovered in mineral deposits, which are literally one billion years old, human-like artifacts, tools created by humans, discovered in mineral uh, uh, deposits, which are literally a billion years old, so that there was some uh, a kind of evidence of, there's a place in Texas, I don't know, the Texans among us, where there are footsteps, footsteps of obviously some kind of a hominid walking on what was obviously very soft ground, and it disappears under a rock. And uh, when they excavate the rock, the rock is literally tens of millions years old. So some hominid was walking into this terrain, and then either through volcanic activity or whatever, it got covered over. But the tracks are still embedded there as a kind of historical and archaeological evidence of previous uh, lifetimes. And so the, the, to speak to the technology then that you mentioned, I think that we have had more advanced technologies and not just necessarily in the sense in which we think of technology today. There are various kinds of technologies. And I think um, the technologies of the, of the mind are much more advanced than the technologies of the hands. You know, that when you look at our evolution over the last 12,000 years since the uh, what's been called the, the Younger Dryas, there was um, a cometary explosion over North America 12,000 years ago that immediately melted the entire ice cap of North America and raised the kind of the, the, the ocean level by over 200 feet. And that's recorded all over the world as the Great Flood, that literally there was a, a cosmic event that released the entire ice sheath of North America into the Atlantic Ocean and then swept across into, into Europe. And so um, I think that uh, there were technologies which were much more about the technologies of mind than they were about the technologies of kind of hands-on kind of developments. So like when we think of this slow progress where we started firstly to kind of amplify our muscles, you know, so we invented like the pulley system. So you can you can use a pulley to lift weights that you couldn't normally lift on your own. Or we started using the ox drawn plow to plow gr ground that you couldn't do with a digging stick. So we're amplifying our musculature at some stage. And then we start amplifying, you know, our eyesight. We develop, you know, uh, eyeglasses or binoculars to see great distances or telescopes or whatever. Uh, and then we start developing kind of our, our cognitive faculties by inventing uh, computing uh, techniques. And then we augment our hearing by developing the telephone so we can have a conversation with somebody in Italy, you know, through a telephone. So one by one, we're learning to augment our physical musculature and our sensorium and some of our cognitive abilities. But I think that there's technologies that utilize our spiritual capabilities. And I have this theory, for instance, about um, the, um, the, the Tower of Babel, this story we read of in the book of Genesis, that the gods saw what the human beings were doing and they were afraid that human beings would get to kind of be as advanced as, as they. And so they decided to come down and confuse our tongues. So the idea was that all humans at that stage Paul, uh, spoke a single language and that the gods came down and they confused our tongues and we wound up at the beginning of the 20th century with 7,000 different languages and dialects. I don't believe that's what happened. I believe actually that earlier um, versions of Homo sapiens sapiens uh, didn't have language at all, didn't have spoken language at all, that we were completely telepathic and that there was a, this instantaneous transfer of information from one mind to the other. And that the way that, that the gods limited us and uh, shackled us was to give us language, because language is a very leaky vessel in order to communicate ideas. One of the greatest linguists of the 20th century uh, talked about uh, three phases of language. He talked about the kind of the uh, the referent, which is the object in the real world, and then he talked about kind of the the signifiers, uh, the signified in the mind, and then the signifiers. So let me explain what I mean by that. So I'm walking in the in the savannah in East Africa, and I encounter an elephant, which I did frequently. Um, so the the elephant is the object in the real world. He's going to call that the referent. There's something out there uh, that I encountered. I'm going to make some kind of a mental image in my mind. That's called the signified. I'm going to take the raw data, 
delivered by my sensorium. So there may be an olfactory component. There may be a kind of an acoustical component. There may be a visual component. And now I build an image in my, in my mind to represent what I encountered. Now, the truth is, I have no idea whether that signified corresponded at all to the referent. I have no idea whatsoever. It's called, in philosophy, it's called the myth of the given. The fallacy that our minds actually deliver a one-to-one -one accurate representation of what we encounter in the outside world. There is absolutely no way of testing that. And so all we know is whatever the data are outside there, the human brain is set up in such a way that it creates some kind of an internalized model. And he called that the signified. Now I'm going to, try to explain to Karen what I saw. I'm going to use signifiers. I'm going to use language. I'm going to do a drawing. I'm trying to communicate an image I have in my head of a referent in the real world so that she too can participate in what I encountered. And so at every stage, there's leakage. So if I could just mentally transfer my signified into Karen's signified, I wouldn't have to use the signifiers or the language and all the problem that I created. But I'm still transmitting a signified to her, and I have no guarantee that my signified actually represents uh, the referent. So if there was some way of transferring the referent from me to her, you know, uh, bypassing my signified and my signifiers, then there'd be an immediate download uh, of data. Now, I believe that's a technology which is much more advanced than nuclear weapons. And I believe that that is a technology available at the other side, that we are literally and this is the experience I described yesterday, where uh, we're in a room, not, I'm going to talk about it today in, in more detail, where people uh, preparing for, uh, on the launching pad to arrive on planet Earth are, are connected as a single mind. And the, the orchestrator of this is, uh, is uh, speaking to everybody simultaneously and everybody is simultaneously hearing everybody else. So that's a kind of a spiritual technology for me. So when I think about Atlantis and Lemurian places like that, I'm not just thinking about the ability to kind of blow our planet to smithereens, you know, or to kind of, kind of uh, develop all kinds of laser technologies, or which are really interesting. But the technology in which I'm most interested, and which I think uh, ally, um, um, lies before at the other side, is a spiritual technology, where literally there's a, there's a data dump of reference, and not just not even signified, let alone signifiers. So that was a long-winded response to your observation. So Anne's question is, and this notion of a, of a, a, a secret, sacred name is, um, are we all given a secret, sacred name? Is it different from incarnation to incarnation? Is it assigned by a mentor figure? Is it self-appointed? Or uh, what's your, my kind of thinking on that? Um, I know that the last things that happen before incarnation is that we are briefed and we get a quick resume of all of the lives we lived previously. So we have a complete knowledge of our own track history. We know exactly who we've been, what we've done, what we've accomplished, what we still need to learn. And we know the exact track histories of everybody who's going to be of significance in the incarnation just about to happen. Uh, the third thing we've talked about is our purpose. We've developed what's my purpose coming down in this time. And then the last thing, the image I have is that Grandmother God singing your secret, sacred name as you wing your way into incarnation. And it's, um, for me, it's, uh, it's not just a, a thing, like saying this is, this is you know, Margaret and this is uh, Michael and whatever. It, that's not the, the meaning. It's a kind of a, it's like an acoustical vibration. It's a logos, and the way in which logos is used in the New Testament where John says in his first chapter of his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the logos, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were created by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. In him was light, and this light was the life of man. Now, I put, I add another step into that, and I say, you are such a word. Every single one of us is a word of God. Every single one of us is an om. You know, Hinduism claims that the, the sound of creation is the, the sound om, that it literally is the uh, vibration, you know, that creates... Uh, uh, all of reality. And so every single person uh, is assigned a name by grandmother God to represent uh, both the essence of the soul and the purpose of its uh, its upcoming incarnation. That's been my experience. Of it. Uh, just to recap very, very briefly what Shanti mentioned, building on our kind of uh, contribution yesterday, that she comes from, you know, in some of her ancestors are literally abducted out of Africa. 
and taken across the oceans and enslaved, you know, and so she's living among people who can identify you know, my Irish roots or my Italian roots or my German roots or whatever, and she doesn't have a kind of a lineage to go back to. And uh, my comment yesterday to her was that in some senses, she utilized that uh, extraordinary difficult kind of history in order to liberate herself from any kind of personal attachment and and that she in fact she could see herself as to use her own words a universalist and she's saying the very same thing now as i listen to her that she went from no story to no story you know, she didn't get stuck with a story in the interim so it's like she's gone from conception to kind of redemption without ever having to without ever having to do pass through civilization it was like the um uh, Oscar Wilde, the Irish wit, one time, one time said when he was uh, he was here in America visiting, and uh, very facetiously he said, "America is the only civilization in the history of humanity that went from barbarity to decadence without ever passing through civilization." So uh, I, I don't agree with him, obviously, but uh, but here's what that's what I hear Shanti saying in some senses that she went from no story to no story without ever getting caught up in the storytelling in the attachment to a particular version or a particular lineage. And so in some senses, it takes a great soul, Shanti, to volunteer for that. It was a very, very tough way to learn the lesson, but by God, you learned it in spades. Thanks a million, Pat. And Shelley's asking about, I, for many, many, many years, I end all of my emails or my letters with the phrase, may God continue to hold you tenderly in the hollow of her hand. And why would we do that? Why would you use a female pronoun? Because part of my waking up in this incarnation, being born uh, Irish and Catholic and a male in a patriarchal society, uh, part of my kind of waking was the realization that we have um, we have completely suppressed the feminine face of God. Uh, uh, I, I have a belief system actually that um, rather than a holy trinity, I talk about holy quaternity and that there's... There's a, it's a, it's a crucifix or a cross which is symmetrical about you know both axes, the vertical axis and the horizontal axis, and so you have the Father representing somehow the masculinity of the divine, and you have Jesus representing the masculinity of the divine, and then you have the Holy Spirit. And my definition of the Holy Spirit is this: this was I got this in a dream several months ago. I wanted to know who the Holy Spirit was, and I woke up in the morning and I had this impression: the Holy Spirit is the divine womb in which embryonic Christ consciousness is marinated in the amniotic fluid of divine love. So that the Holy Spirit actually is a womb-like entity that is ultimate femininity, the ability to conceive, to carry, and to give birth to. And that then the fourth part of it was Mary, the mother of Jesus. That this was a, a, a very advanced soul who agreed to come in as part of a cohort group in order to kind of uh, level the playing field between the feminine aspects of the divine and the masculine uh, aspects of the divine. And uh, we did a retreat here several years ago, actually, in which I talked about spirituality beyond gender, that gender is a temporary placeholder and it needs to be balanced between the male and the female. But there's a place beyond that, that, that is the yin-yang energies, that there are some characteristics which are yin, and uh, often they get they get misidentified with the female. They do not belong to the female only, and that others get identified as yang, and they're identified with the male, and they do not belong to the male only. That they're both male and female aspects, which are really important. So that's a movement beyond gender, and I represented two uh, two stories that I'd come across. One was of a, a woman coming across a car accident in which a one and a half ton truck had flipped upside down and a little baby was trapped underneath. And before the firefighters arrived, this young slim woman lifted a one and a half ton truck off the baby so that it could be pulled out and then she held it to her breast. Now, uh, she needed yang energy to lift a one and a half ton truck off a baby and she needed the yin energy to cut a little baby to her breast. And so it's the ability to know uh, which quality and which virtue to kind of uh, access in what kinds of situations. <laughs> and the other one was um, a story from Australia where there are firefighters in the huge big forest fire, you know, working for days and days and days, and a little koala bear escapes from the fire and it's singed, you know, and it's crying. And this big, big, bulky, muscular uh, firefighter picks the little creature up and is cuddling it and then see that it's absolutely parched. 
and gets a bottle of water and starts to feeding the little koala bear. And you can see it's a pause and it's sucking greedily. So here's a guy who starts off with yang energy again and then flips into yin energy so that our spirituality has to take us beyond gender into the yin yang. And then finally, even beyond the yin and the yang into our divinity. But in the meantime, we have to make up lost ground and we have to start honoring the feminine in a way in which we haven't for hundreds of years. So I made a conscious choice many years ago that uh, I would use different pronouns for, for God. Sometimes he, sometimes she, uh, she, sometimes his, sometimes her. And so I made a constant decision that I would end all my letters by saying, may God continue to hold you tenderly in the hollow of her hand in order just to wake up people from a patriarchal notion that God is some kind of a male figure with a long white beard sitting on a throne in the sky. So it was a concerted effort to get, just get people thinking. What do you mean by saying her hand when he's talking about God? It's been very important to me. One of the reasons I got kicked out of the Catholic Church and one of the reasons why I believe the community of COJ was so powerful is that I made a conscious decision to ordain women you know, in the, in the COJ and that there are women on the altar celebrating Eucharist on a regular basis. And this was a kind of a, this was too far out, far out for the Catholic Diocese of San Jose where I was and for the Catholic Church itself. And so we're lucky enough to have a community where the women celebrate Eucharist, you know, on the altar as priests. And so I have a big belief system that um, that ordination goes in the following way. Every single person on planet Earth is a priest. Uh, you're a priest by virtue of your volunteering for incarnation. So I have, for the last about a year and a half, the first thing I do in the morning when I wake up, I make the sign of the cross. But I don't say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I say, um, I'm grateful that I volunteered for incarnation. I'm grateful that I got conceived by my mother. I'm grateful that I got born. And I'm grateful that I got ordained. So that's my sign of the cross. So it's recognizing the feminine role in that. The femininity of being conceived in a womb and the femininity of being birthed from a womb. So um, it becomes really, really important then that we honor the, the feminine. Uh, and I think that uh, that little group that came in at the time of Jesus was really a balanced organization, that there was a Jesus figure that I call Christ, who gave us Christ consciousness. And there were two Marys. There was his mother Mary and Mary of Magdala. And I believe that they were the bearers of what I call Christa consciousness. So you got the male version is Christ consciousness. Consciousness and the female version they call Christa consciousness and the uh, together they make up the kind of the uh, the incarnational kind of uh, manifestation of the divine which embodies uh, both uh, aspects as well. For those of you who don't know, so you know a little bit about Marie's background. Um, she was trained in Stanford by a very good friend of our community, Dennis Baylor, you know, whom I knew for many many years as well, and. Uh, uh, Marie is a, an expert, particularly on the uh, what I call the neurophysiology of the eye, the optic system. Marie, is that, is that correct? Um, and so this realization that Marie has in her training, they're being told, you know, don't tell me what you feel, tell me what you think. And then coming to the realization that as a scientist, one of her primary tools is imagination, you know, and so coming to that great wake up call that science itself is, is, is a story time. You know, and the story of science has changed radically throughout the history of science as well, as has the uh, storytelling around religion. And that we, we're always going to need stories, but we're always, always going to need to kind of uh, outgrow the present storyline in order to access a better version and a better story, which is more. Uh, and I see this very definitely as the kind of the essence of the scientific method. Uh, whether the science is, you know, the the uh, the neurosynaptic activity of of uh, eye cells, or whether it's talking about the geology, or whether it's talking about the psychology or spirituality, that I see it going through the following stages again and again and again. So the scientists, the first stage is that uh, she's going to make observations in her field of interest. The second thing is that she's going to assemble data as a result of her observations. The third thing is that. She's going to look for uh, uh, putative patterns in her data. The fourth thing is, if she thinks she's identified some kind of a possible pattern, she's going to create a hypothesis that might explain the pattern. The next stage is she's going to do some experiments in her laboratories, which is exactly what Marie does, to kind of figure out, does the hypothesis, you know, does it explain the, uh, the, the pattern? And if she gets a yes answer, the statistics is more than 95% likely, yeah. 
So you're going to have to kind of have her experiment replicated in other laboratories to make sure that it wasn't just a statistical fluctuation. And now she's got confirmation that three other scientists replicated and got the same result. Now you've got a principle established in the field. Now at some stage, you put together a bunch of principles in the field, and now you have a model of the field that seems to explain adequately uh, what, what's been observed. But at some stage, new anomalous data begin to present themselves. And so you've got to tweak your existing model to accommodate the new data. And then at some stage, you know, so much anomalous data arise that the old model is radically inadequate. And now you have to kind of abandon the old model and create a brand new model that can accommodate all the old data and all the new data as well. And that happened twice in the 20th century with um, relativity theory in 1915 and quantum mechanics in 1920. And I see the very same thing happening in, um, in mystical literature, the very same stages. That the mystic is somebody who's fascinated with the particular field, the field of the divine, you know, and makes observations. And then from the observations begins to recognize some possible patterns. And from the patterns creates a hypothesis that might explain the patterns. And then sets up some kind of an exper experimental protocol to test whether the hypothesis actually gives a satisfactory answer. And then has a, finds an answer and then checks with other mystics who are engaged in similar kinds of activities and they all find the same outcome. And now you have a kind of a, a metaphysical or a, um, a mystical model uh, of reality. And then at some stage, there are new experiences that come along. There's a Christ figure that arises, or there's a, a Buddha figure that arises. So now they're introducing new data into the, into the field. And now the model has to expand or be dismantled and be, be can you replaced with another model. So I see the scientific model at work all the time, but it's constantly about uh, changing the storyline. And it's engaged really powerfully, I believe, by the imagination, which is the ability uh, to intentionally alter your state of consciousness, enter into different dimensions, interact with um, uh, entities and energies in, the, in that other dimension, learn from them and bring that learning back. And so many of the great scientific breakthroughs have been either in dreams or in imaginative exercises like Einstein engaged in. So I would say that the chief, um, the chief tool of a great scientist is imagination, is the ability to step outside the existing storyline and imagine a different one.